welcome back to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. Today we're in North Bend, Ohio with Tom Ratterman right here at the Congress Green Cemetery. Thanks so much for talking with us today, Tom. Hi, Danielle. I have an amazing story to tell you today. All right, so let me know what has happened here in this cemetery. Well, uh, the story we're going to have today is about grave robbers. Grave robbers. Yes. <laughs> All right, so who were these grave robbers? Well, grave robbers go back in history a long time, um, centuries, in fact. You know, there were grave robbers in Egypt that we know about, but also in, in Asia and Central America. But these were more looters, mm -hmm. people that were going to loot for the treasure that was with the bodies. You know, so, uh, but today, uh, I think we're gonna talk about something a little different. They were trying to loot the graves for the bodies. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then, so there's, there's a little bit of history of that happening. In fact, even some of recent history, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lincoln's grave was robbed. A lot of people may not know that, but people tried to rob Lincoln's grave, but fortunately, the gang that was involved doing it had a, um, uh, an inside person, an informant, that, uh, that told him about it, so they caught him beforehand, but it was all partially dug up. And another one a lot of people don't know about is Elvis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elvis. Uh, you know, it was a plot that didn't get very far, but it did result in them moving Elvis's grave to Graceland. And then lastly that I have is uh, about Charlie Chaplin. Now his grave was actually robbed. They got the body and they held it for ransom. And they wanted 400,000 Swiss francs for it, which was probably a million dollars in today's money. And uh, the widow refused to pay, you know. So there was another type of grave robber. It was a body snatcher or a resurrectionist. And uh, uh, today we're going to talk about the two people that were dug up that was involved in this case. Okay. So who were the people that were dug up? Well, one of them was John Scott Harrison, and the other one was Gus Devin. Now, John Scott Harrison is famous more for his family. His father, his grandfather was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and his other grandfather was John Cleve Sims, the founder of Hamilton County and this entire area between the Miami Rivers, whose grave happens to be right here. Um, his father was William Henry Harrison. The, uh, hero of Tippecanoe and the, and the uh, general in the War of 1812, as well as the president that we know about. John Scott Harrison inherited 800 acres from his father, William Henry Harrison, and um, uh, that was at the point, called the point, and it's out uh, about four or five miles from here, out at uh, where the power plant is now, where the Great Miami River comes into the Ohio River. And so he was a farmer, but he was also elected congressman. So he was fairly famous in his own right. He was a congressman for uh, probably five or six years. And um, uh, he was also a historian. Um, and in the future, it hadn't happened yet, but some years later, his son would become the president. So his son was a future president. But he was already on the political scene. Benjamin Harrison was on the political scene in Indianapolis. How did they discover that the graves were robbed? Well, he discovered because uh, John Scott Harrison died late in May, May 26, 1878, and the funeral was on May 29th. And so as they were coming to put the body in the grave site, they noticed that uh, another grave had been disturbed. And it just so happens that a week earlier, um, Gus Devin, John Scott Harrison's nephew, was, uh, was interred there, and they could see that that happened. And, you know, of course, they were, they were horrified that that was the possibility. And uh, so immediately, the three Harrison brothers decided that they needed to do two things. One was to hide the fact from the boy's mother, because it was a young boy, he was 23 years old. And uh, the other thing is to protect their father's sight. So they were uh, really interested in making sure that nobody would dig up his grave. Well, they went the extra effort. They put heavy stones over the top of the coffin. They cemented them in and then piled it with a lot, with a lot of dirt. They hired a, um, a, a uh, guard for the grave. His name was Tom Lynn, and they paid him $30, a dollar a day for a month to guard the grave, and they thought that would do the job. So um, they felt fairly secure in that, but the next thing they needed to do was to discover what happened to Gus's body. So uh, 
John Jr. Ben went back to Indianapolis because he had business to take care of. But John Jr. went with a cousin downtown Cincinnati looking around. They kind of had a suspicion about the medical colleges. So they went to the Ohio Medical College with a constable, with a detective, and they looked around and everything. They had a janitor there. I think his name was Marshall. And they showed him around and see there's nothing here he just he said there's no, nothing to think of and finally they were about ready to leave and they noticed a rope on a windlass and the detective says bring it up we're going to take a look and they brought it up now this keep in mind this was the next day after the funeral so they bring up the body and john jr says well that can't be him this is an old man we're looking for a young man gus devon so the detective says, well, let's take a look. And to his horror, it was his father oh, no. laying there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which was certainly tormented him for years. Okay. So after all of that had happened, were there any suspects? Yes, there was a suspect. And there were some ruffians in the town of North Bend and Cleves that they suspected. And one of them was Bob Roundtree. They arrested him for a day. Uh, partially because the things he was saying, you know, he said it was easier to make a, to dig a grave than to make a living and, and uh, hard work and uh, things like that. So the things that were said, and he claimed that he sold a body to someone. So apparently he'd been talking a little too much. So they put him in jail for a day. However, um, they didn't have enough evidence. So they released him. Uh, they did uh, arrest the janitor. The janitor, Mr. Marshall, they put in jail and uh, uh, charged him. And uh, the amazing thing is the faculty from the Ohio Medical College came to his rescue. They posted a $5,000 bond uh, for his release, which was a huge sum in the day. And my thoughts are that when their families, these people who were dug up, when their families found out about all of this, I'm sure they were horrified, right? Oh, they were horrified. You're talking about Benjamin Harrison here, you know, with his family, a famous family, you know, so it became a national scandal. Right. So why did the Ohio Medical College want the bodies? Well, with the uh, advent of more and more medical schools in uh, the United States, there was a demand for bodies for dissection, for education. They needed the bodies to teach the students uh, about anatomy. And uh, so there was quite a demand. And this wasn't brand new. In the 1700s, there was a Dr. Shippen that had, dis had advertised uh, for a dissection class. Uh, but it was a little early in the 1700s and a mob uh, stormed his house. Uh, and Harvard, uh, a little later in the century, so 17 later on, uh, had a medical college that went through 450 bodies a year. And uh, the interesting thing about that that I read was that uh, uh, Paul Revere's son was actually one of the people who helped supply the bodies for that guy. And that was in Boston. And there was, um, uh, in Cincinnati, I, I know of two medical colleges. There was the Ohio Medical College and the Miami Medical College. So uh, probably both of them were in on this. And I know that they were able to find J.S. Harrison, but how did they find Gus Devin? Ah, that's interesting also. Um, they found him because at the Miami Medical College, where nobody was suspected yet, the janitor there got nervous and spilled the beans. He said what was going on, and he exposed an actual pretty much business that was going on. There was a business of pickling bodies and putting them in barrels and shipping them off to other medical schools around the country. Well, we, I don't know how many other places, but we know of two. One was in Ann Arbor and the other one was Fort Wayne. So uh, they were busy putting bodies together for the fall term. And uh, uh, so the detective got a hold of this information and he went up to Ann Arbor. And he found that they did have a number of bodies there. And so, uh, and, uh, so he alerted the family. Uh, and so the brother of Gus Devon came up there and identified him. And so thus they were able to bring him back and, and rebury him. That janitor said, I'm not getting in trouble like the other one did, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how did this national scandal finally end? 
Well, there was a lawsuit, of course, and I think it was the first civil suit uh, in Ohio, so it was kind of a case that the bar was looking at. Uh, but uh, there was two suits. One was uh, the, the case of the Devon family versus Miami Medical College, and the other one, uh, the Harrison family versus the Ohio Medical, Co Medical College. The suit was for $10,000. And so I have some testimony from that I'd like to read. It says the Ohio Medical College and the Miami Medical College contracts with certain persons to supply them with cadavers for dissection and anatomical demonstration. These men make it a business supplying medical colleges here and of other cities, especially in smaller places like Fort Wayne and Ann Arbor. So uh, William or uh, ben Benjamin Harrison was most interested in uh, protecting other families so that they didn't have to go through this. Uh, so, but the lawsuit was not so much about money for him, but changing things in society. And I think he succeeded in this. There was a law in 1881 uh, that changed uh, the availability of unclaimed bodies so that medical colleges could uh, have a supply, the needed supply that they, uh, that they wanted. So uh, finally, then, John Scott Harrison was reinterred. Uh, you know, I guess it's a, I don't know if it's a happy ending to the story, but it is an ending to the story. And they no longer put him in the ground up here in the Congress Green Cemetery. They put him, you can see the, the marker inside of the tomb of William Henry Harrison. He's next to his mother and father, um, William Henry Harrison and Anna Sims Harrison. Wow, that is a lot of really, really good information. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing all of that with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for coming here. No problem. Thanks again so much for tuning in to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. Today we spent time in North Bend, Ohio, learning all about the grave robberies that took place right here at Congress Green Cemetery. We hope that you enjoy learning all about it. Remember, Travel, Travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.